Hey guys, here we are for chapter 9.3. We're looking at humans and species extinctions. Specifically, what is it that humans are doing that are encouraging the rate of extinctions, if you will? Not that it's something we want to do, but something that is happening. Now guys, this is one of these sections that's an important section. You know, it's chief amongst things. Uh, it's a little bit longer than usual, so buckle in and hang on but it's also one you really need to know. This first part, the acronym HIPCO, it's a mnemonic device like PEMDAS in math, etc. But HIPCO, H-I-P-P-C-O. These are our greatest threats to species extinctions or the greatest threat to species in general. And they are this, it is habitat loss, invasive species, population, mainly population growth, and with that resource use, pollution, climate change, over-exploitation, hip code. This is one you've got to be able to pull it out at a drop of a hat and list it out. Habitat loss, invasive species, population growth, pollution, climate change, and over exploitation. Now we're going to step through each one of these basically through this section. I'll try and hit it. It's not even labeled out quite that nicely, but that's really what the remaining slides are going to do to try and highlight and hit what these things do and why they're leading to species extinctions. So up here on the board, let's look at one of these first pictures. And in this case, we're looking at habitat loss. So we have the tiger. Now this is specifically the Bengal tiger, the one that goes through most of India and Asia. Well, in blue, that is what its range used to be. Now, these aren't all the same. Some say it's what it was 100 years ago. Some say this is what it was in the 1700s. But let's just go with historically, the blue has been the habitat range of this animal, and the red is its current range now. So the Bengal tiger used to be able to go through most of South Asia, India, and up into Asia. Now it has very small little areas, basically wildlife refuges. Same with the rhino, a huge swath area, at least a full third of Africa used to be its range. The African elephant, uh, Three-fourths of Africa used to be its range. Now it's down to less than a fourth. Once again, mostly in preserves. And the Asian elephant used to range all the way from Saudi Arabia down through India, across up under the Himalayas into most of Asia, Thailand, Indonesia. And now it has a very tiny range. And once again, when I lived in Thailand, saw many of these, most of its range is now in some sort of preserves or camps for them. Up in the lower areas in Nepal, there were still some wild elephants, but their range is getting very, very small. Humans expand and the habitat of some of these animals gets cut down. Another one having to do with habitat, what we're looking up here is fragmentation. So we can see the farms area here and the really dark areas are the forest. Well, this whole thing used to be forest. The animals that used to live in the area, now they only have small little areas to be in. And you can see it's fragmented. So there's an area of forest here and an area of forest here where the animals can't really move from one to the other very safely. They're either out in the open, which they don't want to be, or they're moving across possibly pesticides, herbicides, etc. So their range has been cut down and it's fragmented. And this fragmentation is a problem as well. Sometimes things are fragmented just because a road goes through it. And now the animals are trying to cross the road and they get hit by cars, etc. and it can cause problems. But here's extreme fragmentation, but it's even referred to fragmentation when we want to road through it. It used to just be open and now there's a road for it and some things don't like to be around the road, the noise, etc. Habitat loss, habitat degradation, 
or habitat fragmentation. These are all largely human-based things. The next one was invasive species. Now, many species that we bring in are actually beneficial. Most of the crops that we grow here in America really weren't here initially. You know, some rice, some wheat, some of the types of chicken or pig. These are non-native species, but they're not invasive. So not all non-native or invasive, but they can be. A lot of non-native species, when they're brought in, do not have any natural predators here. It's a different ecosystem. You bring them in and the predators that used to hunt them there don't exist here and they can easily flourish. They may not have the same level of competitors that deal with them, nor parasites or pathogens. The things that kept them in check over there may not exist here. So this species can thrive and drive out some of the native species. So when we talk about these invasive species, we're talking about non-native, but ones that are causing a problem. Picture up here are some that are affecting in America. This is only a handful. There are literally thousands of invasive species, but some of them we're gonna look up as the African bee, known as the killer bee, been brought in. Kudzu. We'll talk about the vine that ate the South as a case study coming up. Nutria, oh my goodness, we had these things when I lived in New Orleans. They're rat-like creatures, but they're like this big, get in the waterways, et cetera. Uh, once again, not native here, they were brought here kind of for a food source, get out, they're in the wild. Once they're in the wild, very hard to control. The European feral pig, Pigs brought over, they were brought into hunting preserves and et cetera, got out. They're now in 36 of our states. The largest population of these, California, Texas, and Florida. Not which is unusual, some of our bigger states, but invasive species. Sea lamprey. Sea lampreys will attach to trout, other fish. It's one of the invasives. The fire ant came from South America, more than likely either on some timber or brought over with supplies from South America, wasn't brought here intentionally, but hitched a ride on a boat, something of that nature. Also have some termites and a zebra mussel. Kind of right down on the bottom in the center, the Burmese python. Pythons, boa constrictors, getting let loose in the Everglades of Florida are creating a huge problem to the ecosystem down there. Crowding out some of the American alligators, which is a keystone species. We don't want to lose a keystone species because then it can affect the entire ecosystem. I talked about we're going to mention the kudzu vine and kudzu itself. Now, kudzu is known as the vine that ate the South. <laughs> it was brought over from Japan originally as a way to cut down soil erosion. Well, Japan island, but it's also cold. It's farther north and the temperature kind of kept kudzu in check. But down here in the south, the kudzu grows like crazy. You can practically watch the stuff grow if you sit there and look at it. It's incredibly fast growing. It was brought in to help control soil erosion, which it did, but it spreads so rapidly and it's also very difficult to kill. Now there is a common fungus that can kill it pretty quickly, but we really need to investigate more of the potential side effects of this fungus before we start in bringing in a fungus that kills the kudzu because we don't want to killing lots of other things as well. Now kudzu does have possible benefits. It's been used for a lot of homeopathic recipes, a lot of medicinal, nutritional uses, and it also has just potential use as biofuel and also paper. It's a thick enough fiber that we could utilize it for paper. So if we start using it for paper instead of trees, it does grow really fast. This could actually wind up saving some trees. But right now, as you can see from the picture up here, kudzu grows like crazy and just overtakes entire ecosystems if it's not held in check, which can be really hard to do. The other base of species is the wild boar invasion. Once again, it was the wild boar was brought into America in the 1900s for hunting preserves. 
Now, in some of these cases, it escaped, and in other places, people let them go on purpose so that they would breed, and we'd have something to hunt out in the woods. Well, they've multiplied rapidly. As I mentioned before, they're in some 36 states now. They prefer forests, but these guys can live just about anywhere, and they'll eat almost anything. These things get up to usually around 200 pounds. There was the famous hogzilla that was killed a while back. It was up to 18, 18, 800 pounds. But these things will eat almost anything. They dig, they root in the ground, so they tear up crops. They eat through crops, rip up the root systems, tear up the forest. This leads to soil erosion. It winds up getting the streams muddy. So it really affects a lot. Just not a muddy stream, but the muddy stream then affects the ecosystem there, which is expecting a clear stream, and some animals are harmed because of it. And there's just not enough natural predators to go after them. We don't have the wolf population that we used to have. We don't have the mountain lion population. We don't have the panther population that we used to have because of human population growth, once again, degrading habitats of the large predators. So the wild boars have become a real problem. Sometimes these accidentally induced species really do disrupt the ecosystem. We mentioned the Burmese python. Well, it's the Burmese python, the African python, and the boa constrictor. What happens is somebody gets it as a pet, and then after a while that thing grows up from a little snake. These things can get as big around as a telephone pole, and they have to eat a lot. So when you realize you're having to buy large rats to feed this thing, you know, at least one a week, and you're going, man, that's like three, it starts to get expensive, and the animal starts to get really big, but people are attached to them, and they don't just want to kill them or take them back, so they just will release it into the wild. Well, they get in the wild. They don't have the same predators, the same aspect, lots of food, and now they are running loose in the Everglades and competing with the American alligator and others for the food process, and it's a problem. And a lot of times, once these things are there, it's almost impossible to get rid of them. But they are altering the ecosystem and the food webs, and we'll have to kind of see how all of that kind of shakes out and works its way through. Now, controlling invasive species. Prevention is the best way. Once they're here, it can be incredibly difficult, if not impossible. Mice and rats are invasive species, but all over the planet. You know, once they're here, it's virtually impossible to eradicate them. They're just part of the population now. We need to have really solid research on identifying what invasive species are, which ones would be a problem. Then we can put tariffs laws on them coming into the country, if at all possible. We want to track the invasive species, if at all possible, to see where they are, what's going on. A big one would be establishing international treaties so that we can ban the transfer. If we know a particular species is going to be a problem, we want to ban it. Here in Florida, we have a ban on piranha. You cannot own a piranha in a fish tank here. If you live in Wyoming, you can own a piranha because if you let it loose in the rivers of Wyoming, it's going to die. But down here in Florida, the slow, warm water moving streams are the same place where they are in South America, and we really don't want piranha invading our waterways. So we have them banned. The more species we know to have a ban on, and people know not to have them or let them loose, the better off we are. So simple public education about releasing exotic pets. If you have an exotic pet, like a boa, etc., and you can't keep it anymore, Go back to the pet store that you got it from. They'll take it back. They'll find a new owner. You could donate it to a zoo, something of this nature. There are lots of options that you can do which are good for your snake as opposed to letting it loose in the wild. So if you have an exotic animal, don't just set it free if you can't keep it anymore. Take it somewhere, get on the internet, and there are people that will happily take it, provided a good home and a good place instead of out in the wild, where a lot of times they cause problems. As you're out there and making decisions and you get your own home and you wanna have a yard, et cetera, well, 
don't really buy wild plants and animals or remove them from natural areas. If you're going to put something in your house, look at what you're putting. It's better to put species native to the area so they don't wind up spreading and getting out of control. Don't buy wild animals or bring them from somewhere else. Don't go up to North Carolina and find something and bring it home. Leave it there. Don't release pets into the wild, any shape, form, or fashion. Don't dump your aquarium contents or even fishing bait. You go buy fishing bait to go use. Well, it may not be native to this area. They may be raising it, buying it somewhere else. Don't just dump it in the stream. Use it up or take it back to the bait shop. When you go camping, just use local firewood. Because you go, ooh, we'll take firewood. Well, if I take firewood from here in Florida up to North Carolina, and then I set it down on the ground, so we're gonna have a fire tomorrow, well, all the little bugs and animals that may have been in that firewood will get out, and now I've taken an insect from Florida to North Carolina, where it may not actually be. So, use what's there local. Also, Whenever you go hiking around into places, it's best to brush stuff off. Boats, you want to wash your boat off when you get out of the river before going home. Otherwise, you could carry something from here over to there. These are just good ideas, good ways to help control invasive species. So we looked at habitat loss, which includes degradation and fragmentation. We've looked at invasive species. Let's look at population growth. One of the things with population growth is population growth and resource use, as we use more resources. As we use more resources, this increases pollution, which is the second P, population and pollution. And the increase of pollution is what is driving climate change. So population, pollution, and climate change all really sort of go hand in hand. The more population we get, we use more resources, we're burning more fuel, creating more pollution, pollution leading to climate change. Our human growth pushes out wildlife habitat. Once again, I'm all for the Florida panther, but I don't want it in my neighborhood, right? And you don't want it in your neighborhood. They don't want it in their neighborhood and all of a sudden it doesn't have anywhere it can roam because we use up the space. So we degrade wildlife habitat by our simple existence. This is reality but it's something we do want to think about. What can we do? Should we set up preserves? Where can we have areas that are left untouched? Should we have areas that are left untouched? As humans, we can spread upwards, right? We can have taller buildings instead of always making broader footprint cities. Pollution. Now our pollution is not always just burning of coal, burning of gasoline that's making smoke pollution. We also pollute things by putting pesticides and herbicides out. Like I want to control the weeds in my grass and I put a chemical on the ground. I want my grass to grow and I put a chemical on the ground. I don't want mosquitoes out here today because we're going to have a party and I spray a insecticide. Or I don't want aphids on my roses and I put an insecticide. All of these pollutions get into the system and they can cause problems for species. We'll talk about the honeybee in a bit, one that's greatly being affected by these exact things. But we also get this term of bioaccumulation, which then in turn goes to biomagnification. Bioaccumulation is, I put a pesticide out in the ground, well the organisms that are eating the plants that I put it on get some of them in their body. So they get a little bit in stores in their fat, but for them it's just a small amount doesn't kill them. Something eats them. Well, the thing that eats them eats a bunch of them, and they wind up getting a little bit more in their body, and then another consumer eats those things, and they get a bunch in their body, and we get biomagnification. So down in this first organism, it wasn't enough to be harmful. By the time something eats that, and something eats that, and something eats it, because it's not only eating it, it's eating multiple of its and too much of the pollution is getting into this upper organism and they die. Pollution is not only we're burning and putting smoke in the atmosphere. It's a lot of different types of pollution. And our pollution leads to climate change. And we think climate change is really going to accelerate this sixth extinction. 
we are in the middle of a mass extinction event because we're already looking at way beyond background extinctions. And climate change, as things change, it causes a very rapid change of an ecosystem. And this causes a loss of diversity. And any loss of biodiversity causes ecosystem services, water, air, oxygen, food, to tend to degrade. So these are some of the things we really want to look at, think about, pay attention to along the way. Now, I told you we talk about the honeybees a bit. We've talked about them a bit before. There's a case study in this part of the chapter here. It's a search for the causes. Why are they going down? So many times I've noticed in American culture, it's probably true in many other parts of the world, but we always want to look for the silver bullet. You know, the silver bullet is the lore of the, that's how you have to kill a werewolf. A single silver bullet will kill it. Otherwise, it's incredibly difficult to do. Well, silver bullets rarely exist. There's rarely one thing that if we do this one thing, it'll solve it. Occasionally, that's the case, but it's very rare. We feel that there are multiple reasons for the honeybee decline, therefore there's going to be many things we have to do to try and help it, if you will. Parasites are some, viruses that they're running into, the pesticide use, stress from the bees literally being overworked, and poor nutrition. The honeybee population in America, we have industrialized them. So I am a honeybee farmer and I have my bees and you call me up and you say, hey, my apple trees are in bloom. I need to rent 30 honeybee farms. So I put my honeybees on the truck, I drive to your farm and I set the honeybees out and we're gonna leave them there for two weeks. And the honeybees go out and they get all the apple blossoms and fly back in and after two weeks I bring it home. But I don't bring them home, I take them over to Farmer Joe's apple tree and then uh, Cindy's peach tree is ready for them. And you get the idea. And the bees are going here, there, and yonder, and they're getting over work. They're stressed. It's a new environment. They wake up and like, where the heck are we here? And people go out to find it. They're also getting poor nutrition because they're just getting a single crop. Bees in the wild are getting from this and this and that, and they're getting different nutrition. It's just like you eating a plate. If you only ate spinach every day and that's all you ate, you're not getting enough protein and other parts of your diet. If you're only eating chicken every day and that's all you eat, well, you're not getting your vitamin C's. You're not getting the other things. It's best to have a variety of the food. The same with the beets. So they're not getting enough protein. Also, bees eat the honey. They come back and the young get very pollen rich. They feed them the rich pollen dense in protein. And in the winter, the bees eat the honey for their food. Well, you're a honey farmer, you're selling the honey. So you sell the honey and you provide them like sugar water. It gives them calories, but not the right proteins. It's a little of all of this causing the bee population to decline, but it's an issue. Once again, it's not a single cause, so there's not a single fix. It's a lot of things we have to look at and try and identify. The last point is O, over-exploitation. So we've talked about habitat loss, we've talked about invasive species, we've looked at population growth, which also takes us into pollution and climate change because they're all three tied together. The last one is over-exploitation. We talk about exploiting something, I mean, I'm gonna use it for benefit in some way. Well, as my mom would say, too much of a good thing, yeah, that's right, can be a bad thing. Over-exploitation, using too much. Poaching is a big one here. We have animals that are protected. We say, hey, these are endangered animals. They're threatened or endangered, and you're not supposed to hunt them but people want them anyway. Sometimes people want them because they're rare, or et cetera. Organized crime gets behind this because there are huge profits. Somebody out there is willing to pay a lot of money for an elephant trunk because it's rare. Uh, people are willing to pay for rhino horns. They use them in various different 
medicines or for an aphrodisiac to make you want to have sex more often. Although there's no proof that it does these things, there's lots of people that believe it and want it and will pay big money to get it. For elephant tusks, ivory, even though it's illegal to trade ivory or get ivory now, people still want it, so there's a big market for it and people will pay for it. So you go kill an elephant, take the ivory, smuggle it, and get paid. Tigers get poached for their skin and other body parts. Eating tiger penis is supposed to make you sexually very powerful. Once again, no proof that this is the case, but people still believe it and they will buy it as medicine, if you will. So poachers going after things that are illegal to hunt causes a problem for some of these big animals. Also, just the pet trade. Oh, we have a parrot in our house. Well, where did that parrot come from? Uh, if it was bought in the wild, my wife lived in the Philippines and they would trade birds there like crazy. They'd go into the forest, they'd capture all these parrots, bring them in to try and sell them. Two thirds of parrots caught in the wild die before even being able to make it to market to be sold. But the person grabbing them, it's free. They're just going out there and catching all the little birds, put them in, and they'll bring them and try and sell them at the market. Most of them don't survive the capture, transport, and resale. So a lot of the populations of birds decline because of this pet trade. Amphibians, like we already talked about, many of them are going down once again. Ooh, I would like to have a poison dart tree frog because it looks cool. Well, poison dart tree frogs aren't around here. When somebody goes into the area, they catch them, they trap them, bring them here, and most of them don't survive. Tropical fish, tropical fish. We want tropical fish. I have a fish tank, and ooh, look, I've got a Nemo, I've got a clownfish. Well, a lot of these people go and they literally spray cyanide into the water on the reefs, and this causes fish to get stunned and kind of paralyze for a bit so they can scoop them up and then bring them in. Well, once again, spraying fish with cyanide is easy, makes it easy to catch them, but a lot of the fish don't survive it, and then the cyanide actually winds up killing off the polyps that form the coral reefs. So a lot of times this pet trade is actually very detrimental to uh, species because we're exploiting them. So a few pictures here, and they can be a little disturbing, I understand that, but there's a rhino. They just took the rhino horn, because that was the valuable part. Hard to get the meat and other stuff out past, but they can cut off the horn and smuggle it. So the whole rhino was killed just for this little horn, because it's valuable. 70% of the world's bird species are declining, and one of the, uh, Big ones is because of this in the tropical forest. They're threatened with extinction, cutting the forest down and even going in to trade them. So one of the reasons the birds are going down, habitat loss, invasive species, and climate change, but they're an indicator species. Whatever's happening to the birds, because they're a little sensitive, is that smoke alarm lets us know we've got a problem. Birds, there's over-exploitation, we've got degradation of habitat, they're exposed to pesticides because they're trying to eat the insects that are exposed to the pesticide. And they perform a lot of these critical ecosystem and economic services that we need out in the real world, even if it's just insect control. And an extinction of bird species, once again, it's in that food web, food chain, it affects a lot of other species. Last one I'm going to talk about is bushmeat. And the picture coming up, I realize, can be a bit disturbing as well, but it is a reality. Bushmeat in West and Central Africa has gone on in a sustainable fashion for the local populations that live there to get protein for a long time. However, the hunting of this wildlife has skyrocketed in the last 30 years. The Columbus, the red Columbus monkey has gone extinct largely due to overhunting. 
going after it for bush meat. The head we have up here, this is of a lowland gorilla. They are protected. They're not supposed to be hunted or killed in any shape, form, or fashion. However, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzee meats, even elephant and hippos are caught and killed and their meat is just sold in the local markets. So we're trying to bring in alternative sources of protein. So can we teach them how to do fish farms and even breeding a certain form of a cane rat, kind of like that nutri, it's a large type rodent, to bring in sustainable protein instead of hunting out the gorillas, which are really low in numbers, and selling that for market meat. Remember HIPCO. This is how humans are pushing extinctions of a lot of different animals. Habitat loss, invasive species, population growth, along with that, the use of resources, and along with population, tends to up pollution, climate change, and the last thing is over exploitation of certain animals leading to extinction. That is it for section three. Take care and we will see you next time when we look at what it takes to sustain some of these wild species and their ecosystem services. Take care guys. Mm -hmm.